we've been ha having some experience with uh, robotic transactions power vacuum that I want to share with you. Uh, maybe just before I get started, I have an idea about the audience. Uh, so who is doing uh, thyroidectomy is, uh, currently in their practice? It's like uh, almost everybody. Like, anybody doing a robotic uh, transaction? Okay. okay, great, great. Uh, the, you know, the history of thyroidectomy I always find fascinating because it involves a surgeon who got the Nobel Prize. You all know uh, Coker established uh, modern principles in the late uh, 19th century and uh, uh, de determined uh, the principles that we've been using for a long time. And as you all know, we use the transfer cervical incision. And it wasn't until uh, the 2000s that we actually changed our technique slightly. I know some of us uh, use these uh, coagulating cutting instruments uh, and uh, this enabled us to actually make the incision a little bit smaller. And uh, uh, over the last couple of years, then we introduced the robotic uh, approach, which enabled us to actually get rid of the incision completely in the neck in uh, selected patients. Uh, it's not new that the, the surgeons tried to do uh, the thyroidectomies uh, through uh, alternative uh, approaches. Uh, as you all know, cervical approach was used by putting troll cars, uh, uh, bilateral axillary, and uh, 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 breast approaches were used, uh, and also some surgeons uh, tried to do the operation for an axillary approach, and they published all their papers. And the bottom line was uh, they, these techniques were cumbersome uh, due to inadequate instrumentation and uh, the operator ergonomics were quite unsatisfactory. You all know that the advantage of the robotic surgery, uh, mainly the 3D view and uh, the wristed instruments uh, actually enabled us to do the operations in the, these uh, small halls. And uh, uh, Dr. Chang in Korea uh, adapted this technique to the transaxillary approach. He's already done a number of transaxillary endoscopic thyroid activities and he combined uh, the technique uh, with uh, the robot. Uh, so which patients are candidates for this operation? Uh, these are not very advanced uh, uh, thyroid problems. Uh, uh, most of the time, these are follicle proliferations with a tumor size less than 3 centimeters. And if it's a well differentiated thyroid cancer, uh, it's generally less than 2 centimeters. Patients with uh, adhesions uh, relate to previous neck surgery as well as inflammation due to severe uh, uh, cancer with uh, lymph node metastasis and uh, also those uh, patients with uh, posterior located nodules. Let's so kind of show you the technique. Uh, the patient plays the spine. And uh, uh, the, if the lateral arm is uh, uh, placed on a semi-extension on an uh, arm board, uh, this patient had a <coughs> right thyroid nodule, which is about two centimeters, and on final aspiration, it was suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. She was interested in the technique, and then we consented her for this operation. So what we do is first uh, mark the, uh, the thyroid on the uh, skin, and then uh, the incision is in the axilla, it's about uh, five to six centimeters. Uh, and then we mark uh, the tunnel on the skin. Uh, you know, this is a pretty different approach uh, that we've never used before, so it's easy to get lost. So we mark the tunnel on the skin. Then we start with the incision, we place a little bit higher uh, than what we marked, and then we uh, create a flap over the pectoralis uh, major muscle into the central neck. By going through the two heads of the stenocolloidomastoid muscle, we enter the central neck, and afterwards we place this retractor, which was designed with Dr. Chang, which elevates uh, the flap so you don't have to use insufflation. And then, then we bring the robot in. There are a couple of different techniques. Uh, 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 some surgeons use uh, four robotic arms. Uh, we like to use only three. Uh, initially, a uh, uh, chest wall incision was also used, but we switched to complete a single incision uh, eventually. And uh, um, uh, the problem in the United States is that, uh, in contrast to the Korean patients, the patients' uh, body habits can be quite challenging, as my past, you know, colleagues who work in the United States know. So sometimes you cannot even finish the flap uh, for the open incision. As you can see, there are the, the strap muscles that uh, we have to take down uh, robotically uh, in order to gain access to the central neck. Uh, 
the sternocleidal osteoid muscle is in the clavicle head and the sternal head has been lifted up. <coughs> and after we take uh, the strap muscles and we're able to see the uh, thyroid in the background. Obviously this patient has an uh, indeterminate thyroid FNA and we should be ready to do a total thyroidectomy. So it's important to create your flap uh, quite uh, extensively uh, initially. And as you can see, we're now uh, dissecting anterior to the thyroid and we want to dissect all the way to the contralateral side. The view is uh, really great in the console that uh, all of this is in much better quality on the console. And uh, uh, you know, if, if the robot is back appropriately as well, uh, and there's not instrument collision, then doing this dissection uh, becomes easier. Then we start uh, working on the lower pole. So this is the right side. Uh, uh, this is inferior, this is superior. And we like to see, we like to do everything as we're doing with the open uh, operation. Uh, we encounter a uh, center neck lymph node in the right side, and we send it for frozen. And the frozen actually, this patient came back as papillary thyroid carcinoma, so we knew that we had to do a total thyroidectomy and also do a right center neck dissection. We had done a number of uh, thyroidectomies, and since the exposure was good, we said, well, okay, we can keep going. Like the open technique, I was a part of a teaching institution. You generally take a resident or fellow for the operation by using a, a Kelly, uh, like a fine tip Kelly or a right angle. And we're trying to mimic the same uh, approach, just exposing the tissues and not really cutting anything blindly. And as we are done with the lower pole, uh, we're moving towards the upper pole and we can see the recurrent engineer is seen. Uh, I find that it's uh, pretty straightforward to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the ipsilateral side. And uh, uh, then we're uh, dissecting the ligament of Berry here. And uh, because of the wristed instrument, I like to use the cavea forceps. Uh, it's uh, possible to uh, really dissect the ligament of Berry and, and uh, safely drop the nerve down. For the upper pole, in the open operation, we generally do the upper pole first before we dissect the nerve, but uh, because of the different approach, in this case, you can see that we modify the technique a little bit. We're uh, working on the upper pole from a slightly posterior angle, and then afterwards, we're able to pull the upper pole down, and we're doing the upper pole vessels uh, last. Uh, the order of the steps changes uh, in each case uh, depending on the, the space and the relationship with the patient's the thyroid. Sometimes we're able to follow everything as we do open as well. In this patient, uh, we've uh, dissected the right lobe and uh, we're uh, uh, dividing it at the isthmus so we can get rid of it and work on the contralateral lobe. There's a last attachment to the trachea. So the contralateral side is a little more challenging, but uh, if you have a good flap and uh, uh, use the angle scope, uh, you can still do a full thyroidectomy for the lateral incision. incision. What we do is we mobilize uh, the uh, thyroid for an immediate lateral pain just working the over the This is a seven meter capsule body. close to the capsule and don't do anything blindly, uh, it's uh, possible to identify the nerve. And uh, with these moves, obviously, you have to be very careful not to burn the trachea, but uh, uh, we have a first lesson, we use a suction uh, tip and uh, uh, it uh, retracts the trachea away and uh, we've not had any issues, but cases of tracheal perforation have been demonstrated. Uh, in this case, uh, now we're going to remove the central neck's uh, 
after 12 thyroidectomy. Uh, <coughs> you know, these are the lymph nodes, and uh, it's very important to keep track of the recurrent laryngeal nerve as you're uh, doing this part. The, we can see the nerve very clearly. We have to make sure we stay away from it. And this time, I'm fine. This time, I'm going to use the nerve of the nerve of the nerve. And I'm going to keep the pulse, and you can see the upper part of the heart going into the skin in the field as well. So, I think of time, this time. Uh, this is a totally different approach and uh, even for high volume uh, conventional surgeons uh, this is a big learning process. You can see we looked at our initial 12 total thyroidectomies and the first case took about uh, 5 hours uh, and uh, the docking uh, which is uh, here actually, the, the docking took about 2 hours and the flap was close to 2 hours. Now after having done about 20 cases now we're able to come down to about a little bit over two hours for the whole procedure which is uh, acceptable in our practice but according to Chan the learning curve is about 40 to 50 cases. The patients obviously cosmetically love the operation. You can see that this patient already formed some hypertrophic scar and it's better that she has an incision here and not in her neck and uh, we had all kinds of uh, patient uh, uh, age spectrums and you see it's slightly uh, more uh, senior patient and uh, you know still she was interested in the operation. This patient had a unilateral uh, actually thyroid lobectomy, smusectomy done. Uh, it came back cancer and she was very happy about the procedure. She wanted the control lateral side removed robotically as well. So she has uh, two axillary scars but she's very happy that she doesn't have an incision in her neck. Uh, this is uh, summarizing our first 20 cases. Uh, just want to emphasize that uh, 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 the tumor size relatively small between about 0 0.9 to 3.8 centimeters. We were able to bring the, down the operating time to 99 minutes in one of our recent cases, but obviously initially you have to be get ready for long operative times. It's important to know if you're doing a good job oncologically or not, and uh, the post-op thyroglobin levels were acceptable in the patients, and no patients developed any significant hypocalcemia uh, that was permanent. And uh, it's possible to do a 12 thyroidectomy for a unilateral incision as uh, with using the methods I uh, explained. Uh, we have uh, radioactified on data on some of our patients who went on to have their ablations done. This is a patient who had a 2.4 centimeter uh, palpatory thyroid carcinoma and uh, you can see the pre-treatment scan, the 24 hour uptake was 1.15% which is quite acceptable in open cases if it's less than 2% we are happy. We have applied this approach to uh, the parathyroids as well. Uh, these patients have to ha again have a appropriate body habitus and they have to have a preoperative uh, localization of a single gland. You can see on the ultrasound this is uh, the thyroid, and if you're thyroid, you can see the uh, right lower parathyroid gland. Uh, again, we consent these patients appropriately. The same uh, approach is used, but uh, the overall dissection and the center neck is less extensive. And uh, we find this parathyroid adenoma, and uh, we also do intra PTH determination. We had more than 50% drop, so we stopped, and the patient's uh, labs were pretty good after the surgery. So we got about uh, six uh, parathyroid documents as well. So overall, uh, we use this for thyroids, uh, cervical parathyroids. We also had one major sign of parathyroid, and we also use it for some other endocrine cases. Uh, uh, obviously, the uh, largest experience comes from uh, Korea. They've done uh, thousands of these operations. This is one of the early uh, series, which compared robotically to open. And in this early series, interestingly, their uh, incidence of transient hypocalcemia was less in the robotic group. This is one of the uh, most recent series of 300 uh, uh, thyroid cancer uh, uh, cases. And I uh, just want to highlight that the experience, the operative time is uh, a little over two hours. And the, uh, the uh, approach time, which is the flap time, is about half an hour, which is pretty well. Usually it could be you know, uh, two hours if uh, uh, you are not experienced. 
uh, they show that they treated a wide range of cancer, but it's important that most of their uh, cancers were uh, uh, papular microcarcinomas. So this is a slightly different uh, uh, practice compared to what we do in the United States. Uh, we generally don't even biopsy lesions in their nodules that are less than a centimeter. Uh, this is their complication overall is acceptable, but I want to highlight that with this approach you can add some weird complications to your series. As you can see, seromas uh, and uh, arm paralysis and Horner syndrome. So it's important not to position the arm in a very extended uh, uh, position. And uh, again, being very careful about the dissection uh, in order to not uh, get into these uh, problems. The only uh, series so far that have documented uh, benefits compared to the open uh, uh, thyroidectomy is this uh, series again from uh, uh, Korea, where they noted uh, reduced postoperative neck and swollen discomfort after robotic thyroidectomy. But this was not a randomized study. Overall, uh, I, I believe that the robotic instrument is taking thyroid serotonin for a year. Uh, uh, there are some problems with the acceptance of uh, the procedure and the eligible patient in the United States. Uh, but in selected patients with the criteria that I show you, it seems to be a valid alternative. And obviously we need a, a future experience to really assess the value of robotic thyroidectomy uh, with outcomes uh, in comparative studies uh, to really establish the role. But it's pr pretty realistic to start the first cases with relatively easier patients, uh, uh, preferably a nodule less than two centimeters, initially benign, nodules and the thyroid orals are less than four centimeters and i think it's very important to have a good teamwork and these are my actually partners at the clinic clinic who help uh, develop this program uh, thank you yeah the robot actually has a harmonic uh, uh, built into it you can use a harmonic with the robot but it's not angulating it's great uh, this fast axillary approach seems very uh, good for visualizing the neck as a whole. Have you tried the uh, robotic neck dissections with this approach? Has it I, I haven't tried uh, robotic neck dissections. I've done thyroid lobectomies. I have not done uh, total thyroid, so I'll, I'll defer. You know, in Korea, they actually start doing a uh, uh, modified radical neck dissections. What they do is they use the uh, same accidents and make it larger and they raise a big flap find the accessory nerve first and then they switch their docking uh, uh, at least once uh, you know to get to the higher levels. They've done about 100 cases now they actually recorded uh, in their series. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the reason why I've seen from the ENT surgeons uh, that they're using the robot they're, they're using the robot uh, uh, for uh, their neck dissections as well. There's some videos actually going to come up in publication soon. Uh, so yes, yes. The, uh, that's the that's the face lift approach yeah, that yeah, Harris yeah. is, uh, is uh, putting out. And there's also uh, a uh, transoral approach going into the thyroid from the floor of the mouth, going straight down underneath the strap muscles. Um, and uh, people, Ralph Tofano and others, have been actually uh, uh, investigating that approach.